committee uh, to uh, day two this week, Thursday, uh, of our afternoon meetings. Uh, we have until about four o'clock. And we will be getting to, in the second hour, we're going to be talking to uh, members of the federal delegation that's going to give us a, a little bit of a lowdown on what, on what the CARES Act is and what's been passed so far, especially as it relates to the work that we're doing. There's, I've been getting um, bits and pieces of not only, and Damien's, Damien's summary from yesterday was exceptional and has been uh, roundly um, praised as being um, really top notch in terms of a lot of the other stuff that's been out there. It's been very specific to the work that we're doing in the building, um, not just our committee, but in all the other committees as well. And so the federal delegation will be here to review that. Um, and before that, we will hear from uh, Kobe Schwader, who is from Vermont Vermouth. Uh, again, we discussed last week the Omnibus Alcohol Economic Development Bill. We, we did not get testimony yet from Kobe. And so uh, this is the section on the bill about the about the vermouth and how it's being classified is really is from what we gathered last week is the last section of the bill that we needed to really hear more testimony on the rest of it. We'd, we'd either decided to cut one section and, and keep the rest uh, moving forward. Um, and before that, we're going to hear from uh, on the rental eviction section, we're going to hear from Jean Marie and um, and Angela Zakowski and David Hall, uh, we had one section left, uh, that primarily one section left that was still to be discussed and they um, apparently have reached a conclusion and a compromise that, that will get explained to us by the end of today or tomorrow. And, I, and Lisa, I wanna follow up on the question that you had yesterday about voting. Um, it is clear that we're still in a no, no voting uh, out of bill um, process right now. I think between timing and the way that um, we we don't know when we're going to meet next as a body, uh, whether it's electronically or or with a or with a quorum in the building. But um, basically, the instruction I was given this morning is that we're still not officially voting on any legislation. But when it comes to this particular legislation, as I discussed yesterday. Um, I would like to be able to take with with this compromise that's that we're that's going to be explained to us. I would by the end of today like to take a straw poll on the eviction process, decide whether or not we keep the FMLA in it, and then be able to share this language just by taking a straw poll and ex and saying that we as a committee for um, this week we're done with this bill and we want the Senate who may be able to act faster as, as Tucker was talking about, they're considering um, rules changes to allow them to meet and vote electronically. Um, but, but the ability to say that we have come to a conclusion at this present time on this particular language and then share it with the Senate so that they can um, perhaps put it into a bill and then send it back to us as early as the end of next week. Um, and then that'll take us closer to the third week of April, which may be uh, a time when we'll be able to take up COVID related legislation. So we will get this bill back into our court. Um, but that's kind of a, that's kind of the understanding that we're working with. Again, the Senate may make changes, but they were, um, they're gonna meet tomorrow morning on this bill. And so it'd be nice to be able to give them um, something that we're proud of, something that we feel like is finished for the time being and, and, and let them, get it through start through the parliamentary process. Um, so that's where I'd like to go today. Um, let's start with, um, I, I'd like to start with um, very quickly, I hope the advocates, Jean and Angela, um, I'll start with Jean today. Uh, and if you could just discuss the conversations that you've had in the last uh, 23 hours, that would be that would be great and just give us an understanding of and then david at, after they give their intros then we'll ask you to just sort of show us what um what we're talking about in language so jean go ahead um thank you uh so when we left yesterday we um were something at the very top of the bill which is um in a section called duties which is more or less reminders of what can still happen. So this is an eviction moratorium bill, and but certain things still have to happen. Um, we had 
you know, certain things still have to happen, like tenants still have to pay rent, um, mortgagors still have to pay their mortgage payments. Um, the section we wanted to talk about is the court will still be able to hold emergency hearings on landlord tenant cases if it's an emergency. And what we did is add some specific language that more or less defines or we're agreed upon um, what we're thinking about when we talk about an emergency. So those, those words are now in um, the bill. Uh, the other thing we did is we rearranged, or just as you were speaking at the beginning of this meeting, we've been emailing back and forth and David will explain, he's rearranged uh, section F, which is about what happens to writs of possession um, and arranged it in a more readable order. Um, so uh, we did that. The other thing in section F that we was um, for people who have already received a writ of possession because court process uh, been going through and there were people who have already received a writ of possession, what should happen? Um, should those people get kind of specific notice of that their writ of possession has been stayed? And so we worked out language on that. So uh, we're all agreed with all the language we have in the bill right now. We're just... <laughs> Representative Stevens, you're muted. It's a tough one. I, I'm sorry, everybody. I keep un I keep muting because of ambient noise. But Angela, please feel free to chime in. Sure, thank you for uh, letting me talk. I uh, would echo what Jean said. Uh, we've been working diligently and this morning uh, we came to consensus on the remaining two points as Jean described. Um, and I think she did a great job describing it. Um, so I'd again like to thank everybody for their hard work. Uh, we were all commenting this morning that we cannot remember another time when we have brought a consensus bill uh, to the committee. Yeah, it's, um, it's a long road, um, but thank you. Thank you for your work. And I, would, I wanna, we have two questions um, before we get to David, um, John. You unmute. There you go. All right. Well, maybe it's when David, I, I think uh, at least uh, Representative Hango brought up yesterday and we, when we refer to changes, it helps us to see what page we're on. Cause it, it was so, but I think it's highlighted in David's most recent version. Um, but I think if we keep talking about it, let's go to the, the page itself in the bill that, that helps me to understand the changes. But I think sure. if David has it, he'll show it to us. But for Gene and Angela, it still is a little hard to follow if we don't if we don't know what lines we're looking at. So page yep. number and line would be helpful. Okay. And David will get there, I think. Um Chip, do you have a quick question? Um or do you want to wait till after David um, goes through? Well, no, I, it was uh, pretty similar. You know, sections are numbered, not lettered, and uh, it was a little confusing, Gene, as to wait what you. Were yeah, let's to point let's out. let David let's let David um, walk through it. I think that's probably the best bet, and then we'll go from we'll go from there. Thank you, David. All you're right, on. So we have a bit of a change. I have to start the screen share now, and I can then assign it to David. Um, so, um, 11.1, uh, just got to find your name there, David, just a moment. All right. One more time. Uh, oh, come on. Ah. I'm having trouble finding David's name. There it is. Okay. So David, you now have uh, control of the screen. Okay. Um, 
Um, I'm not sure what that means. It means that you can now, well. Am I doing this now? Yes, you're doing that. OK. And I trust everybody can hear me. Yes. Uh, I have a slightly different setup of my camera. I hope it's OK. I hope you're not spending all the day looking up my nose. I'm feeling severely underdressed right now. The camera is down, and the, I've got my TV now, so I can see you all. It's great. Um, David Hall Legislative Council draft 11.1, um, on, specifically on the housing related issues, <clears throat> which begin, I assume right now you just want to talk about what has changed. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we'd like to see the information um, that you presented yesterday that still had to be resolved, which it sounds sure. like it has been resolved. Sure. So I'm going to scroll down to that. Um, to be fair to Jean, I think she was uh, just trying to give you the general information, so I would still have something to do. Thanks, Jean. Okay, so um, we are in section nine again. And I'm on page 10 of the bill. So, uh, so again, page 10, section nine, subsection B, duties. So as Jean was saying, um, the function of subsection B here is to state explicitly uh, you know, what rules continue to be applicable for everybody, notwithstanding this slate of emergency changes you're proposing to make to the underlying frameworks for ejectment and foreclosure actions. So B1, 2, and 3 we already had, and that is you have to keep paying rent. You have to keep paying rent into court if you're under uh, that order. And if you're a borrower under three, you have to keep paying your mortgage. Um, B4, B4 um, is also sort of uh, just an explicit statement of the court's continued ability to act in emergency circumstances. Um, so let me just read it, B4. This section does not limit a court's ability to act in an emergency pursuant to Administrative Order 49 issued by the Vermont Supreme Court as amended, including when a landlord terminates a tenancy pursuant to 9 VSA 4467B2 based on criminal activity, illegal drug activity, or acts of violence, any of which threaten the health or safety of other residents. So those last pieces on 14 and 15, those are uh, what is included in 4467B2. Those are the grounds for termination under that subdivision in current law. Um, so court still has its ability to hold emergency hearings again under that order, it is in the discretion of the judge what an emergency is. And then this makes explicit that this includes these exigent circumstances that may be uh, brought to the court. And then the court's gonna have to decide whether or not this is in fact an emergency and whether or not they will hear and or act uh, in the case. Any questions? Chip, you okay so far? Okay. All right. So now I'm going to skip over C pending actions. I'm going to skip over D new actions. I'm going to skip over E writs that weren't yet issued when this act came along. And we're going to go to F. This was the question of what happens to writs of possession that a court already issued. 
So again, I just sort of restructured this um, starting at the most general level and then working down through specific cases. Um, but in, in the stakeholders have signed off on the wording. I certainly have not intended to make any substantive change to their hard work. It's just the way I've organized and phrased some of these pieces. Um, under F1, is everybody with me on page 12, F1? So here, a writ of possession that was issued by a court prior to the effective date of this act is stayed as of the start date of the emergency period and resumes running when the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration. Under two, if a writ of possession was issued but not executed prior to the effective date of this act, then after the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration, A, the plaintiff shall serve or serve again the writ to the defendant and the plaintiff shall be restored to possession not sooner than 14 days after service. So let me just break that down for you uh, to allay any fear or confusion. So we're talking about a writ of possession already issued by the court. The court has already decided this case and issued this writ. The writ would have an execution date, the date when possession is going to transfer, that the tenant is going to either have to be gone or be removed from the property. Um, so this is a stay, excuse me, this is a writ that was issued, but it was not executed prior to the effective date of this act, right? So we hit pause on that writ as with all the others, okay? But Upon the date that the governor terminates the state of emergency by his declaration, plaintiff has to serve or serve again the writ to the defendant. And then the, after 14 days after that service, the plaintiff will be restored to possession. The last piece, subdivision three, I'm on page 13 of 15 at the top. We're still in F, we're still talking about writs that were issued before this act. So if it was, if a writ of possession was served but not executed prior to the effective date of this act, then the sheriff or constable who served the writ shall coordinate with the court to determine how to notify the defendant of the stay of the execution date. So again, this is it, a writ that was issued. It was served, but they had not yet reached execution. And so you remember maybe yesterday, the issue was, should the onus be on the sheriff or constable to provide written notice to that defendant that the writ has been stayed? And the sort of consensus proposal here is that the sheriff or the constable will coordinate with the court on how best to notify the defendant of the stay. So any questions on the subsection F? Chip? So, um, I'm unmuted, okay. So David, um, what, constitutes how to um, provide this notice? Is that in writing or in person? Is, is that what we're talking about here? Are you referring to subdivision three? Yes. Um, well, that will be determined by the court and the sheriff or constable who served the writ. But what I'm saying is the options would be either in writing or in personal service. Uh, is that what we're thinking about here? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, does, it doesn't specify how. I mean, presumably, 
it would be, I assume it would be by a mailing to the address um, where the writ was previously served. I, I doubt it would be brought in person by the sheriff as we're trying to minimize personal contact. So I would assume that it would be uh, a mailing, but if there's an email on record, they might choose to do that. Um, they might choose to do both. Uh, so it's really gonna be up to the court. Okay. Okay, further questions right now? All right, I don't see anyone raising their hand at this point in time. Um, so again, I will say, um, well, what's this next point, David? Is that um, I just I highlighted this because I just changed a couple of words here. I did uh, same thing, and it's a it's a much smaller change. I didn't actually send this around. I don't think anybody will be upset, but I, I also didn't want anybody to be surprised that there are a couple of words changed here, um, just to be consistent with the phrasing and the rest of the bill. That's it. That's truly it. Oh, uh, change the, the section number here because it was 11 and now it's 10. And David, so um, we are, uh, again, I think we're going to, if there's no further questions for you today, right in this minute, um, I think that there's, we're going to have a conversation about this after we hear, after we get through our other witnesses for the, for the day um, and make some you know, decisions on on um, what we feel about, especially with the rental, with, with, with the whole bill, but specifically with the rental stuff. And I understand that you'll be meeting with the Senate. The Senate is interested in this language as well and moving forward with it as soon as, um, as early as tomorrow, perhaps Monday. So um, we just, as a committee, wanna be able to sign off on it as well before we, um, bef you know, just before we pass it to them in this way. Um, obviously they're, they're able to do what they need to. Um, but I think that it's in, in the scheme of things, we're trying to get these protections out as quickly as we can. Um, so I think, I think we'll set you free and then be in touch with you via email um, to let you know what happened for the, um, later on today. I mean, you're obviously welcome to be here, but if you have work to do, please feel free to um, uh, duck out. Sure, and I'm happy to sign back in as well if you need me to. All right, if we do, then we'll have, we'll have Ron get in contact with you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you. And I, can, I guess I'll say the same thing to, um, to Jean and Angela, because we... Um, I appreciate again all of the efforts that that the two of you have put into this um, over the last several weeks to get to this point. And um, the committee will have a, like I said, will have a conversation later on this afternoon uh, about this. But you're free to you're free to stay on, or you can um, or you can just sign off, and we'll be in touch. Um, and I'm sure you're going to be working tomorrow. So thank you. All right, I see them waving goodbye. Um, all right, so to, uh, next up is, uh, so Tucker has, has left as he said he would. Um, so committee, do we have questions about, um, and, and Ron may, maybe, well, I don't, I don't know, do we need to see the language in the bill that we're, that we're looking at? Um, I think the question, in the section on the vermouth was that there is a um uh as written the bill would say that we would be allowing a vermouth that has less than 16 percent to be uh sold as a vinous beverage and that there would be a, and then then vermouth above 16 percent would remain essentially fortified wine and uh the testimony we heard last week was from the commissioner um, who did send us an email saying that he did um, 
um, he he took back some of the testimony that he gave regarding some of the conversations that he'd had with the board. The board had not yet made the decisions that he had testified that they were making. Um, but also, we received an email from Kobe uh, Schwader. Am I did I get that right, Kobe? Um, and Kobe wanted the opportunity to testify uh, in in response to what he heard last week. And I think again, given given this, the, the multiple sections in this bill, um, this was the last section that we had pretty, we had all pretty much signed off on, on all of the other sections of the bill or made decisions. Um, I believe we said that we did not wanna move forward with the um, giving the department the ability to charge um, for their services at this time when it came to festivals. Um, and then there was a question over over this um, section of the bill. So with that, Kobe, I'm going to unmute you if you can just introduce yourself to the committee and, you know, give us your two cents on, on what we're contemplating here and why it's important to you. Great. Thanks. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm, I'm Kobe Schwader. I just started a new company in Brattleboro, Vermont, Vermouth. Um, focusing on making uh, aperitif wines, vermouths, and other vermouth-related beverages. Um, and uh, some of this came about because of the, uh, some of the miscommunication between me and the, the Department of uh, Liquor, um, uh, some of which uh, the commissioner talked about last time, although I disagree with him on some of the points he said, but that I'll leave a moment. Um, my main points for the bill um, are Two, uh, one is that I don't think the system is clear as it is, and I have a couple. Um, and two, addressing the, is this language just for one business? Um, so uh, to start, um, uh, I'd like to say that I don't think the system is, is very clear at all in the area where I'm working. Um, uh, for one, uh, uh, the commissioner mentioned that the classifications are based on the use of spirits um, and not the alcohol. Um, but that's not actually entirely true. Um, for example, a non-fortified wine that happened to get over 16% alcohol would be classified as a fortified wine despite not containing spirits. Um, so it seems that the, the definitions are around the alcohol level and not necessarily um, how much spirits are added. Um, application for fortified wines under 16%, at least fortified wines that are not vermouths. Um, so uh, for example, if, if a producer made something like a light port that's 10% alcohol. Um, it's not, uh, the fortified wine definition doesn't uh, include that. It says anything above 16%, but that wouldn't necessarily fit well into uh, the uh, Venice beverage definition or the spirits definition necessarily. Um, I bring this point up specifically because I have one product um, that's a fortified apple wine um, that federally is not considered a vermouth. Um, and currently the Department of Liquor seems to be con uh, considering it a vermouth, but if they change their mind, I don't know where this would fall. Um, that's not necessarily, um, the, the, this, this is partially in reference to the earlier wording of the bill where it included more than just vermouths uh, in the fitness beverage, uh, which I'm still in favor of. Um, and my, my last point in the, uh, the, the, def the definitions are not clear part um, is uh, I think just my interaction with the shows that <laughs> the system is not clear given that uh, initially licensing, the licensing department told me that it would be a Venice beverage. Uh, and then the enforcement department came in and told me it was going to be spirits. Um, and then when we met with the board, the board seems to be leaning towards classifying my products as fortified wines. Um, but they have not given an official ruling yet, but at least from what the mayor um, uh, said last week, that seemed to be uh, where they're leaning towards anyway. Um, so it, it, it seems like uh, there could be some help in rewording uh, these I'm sure that everybody knows where all of the um, all you know any pot potential product could fall. Um, okay, so my my second major point is addressing whether this proposed legislative change is just for a single manufacturer. I are we making this change just for me, or are, do other people benefit from it? Um, and yes, obviously the wording would benefit my business quite a bit. It was part of my business plan was creating things that I would consider business beverages. Um, but in my talks with um, other wine producers and bars and restaurants um, as I was promoting my product, um, I found that lots of people would be interested in vermouths and frankly other low alcohol fortified wines also um, if they were to get them. Um, 
So first, uh, for uh, all other Vermont wine producers, if this bill, if this wording goes as it is, would be able to a lot of Vermont wine producers already make non-standard wines. They make maple wines or apple wines or blueberry wines. Um, and I bet uh, that with the current popular interest in you know, local herbs and tanicals that you'd see at farmer's markets and things like that, um, that we would see a boom in some creative products by winemakers um, and that would allow them to create these products without changing their licensing and still being able to go through their normal sales uh, models. Um, for wine stores, the uh, second class licenses, um, they would be able to carry a variety of products if the, um, the legislature went through. Um, so I've heard from a bunch of my contacts in wine stores that customers do come in asking about sherry port or vermouth. Um, and they're often disappointed when they find out that they can't buy them at the wine store that they're going to, that they have to go to the liquor store to get them. Um, and I think the fact that a bunch of my local stores um, carried my and sold my product in when I was operating as a Venice beverage for the one week that I was operating as a Venice beverage um, shows that they would be interested in carrying these products and would sell them um, to the public. Um, and finally, the bars and restaurants um, would be able to order these specialty vermouths and if broader wording, potentially other fortified wines um, from their wine distributors. Um, I've heard from bar management that they have great wine distributors who go all around the world and find these really cool small craft products from you know Italy and Spain and bring them over. And the bar and restaurant, the bar managers are able to buy wines from these people, um, but they're not able to buy, say, craft vermouths. Um, and there's been a big boom in craft vermouths in Europe recently. So there's lots of little manufacturers, especially in Spain and Italy, some in Germany too. Um, and uh, that trend of the interest in vermouths is. Uh, slowly coming over to the US. That's part of why I you know, wanted to start my business the way that I think there's going to be an increase in, in production and interest in the US too, among um, especially you know, cocktail drinking crowd on you know, more interesting for booths. Um, and so this change in legislature would allow the bars and restaurants to be able to buy you know, specialty vermouths from all around the world through their wine distributors um, and not have to rely on some small manufacturer in Italy getting into the Vermont state store through the state agency and then waiting for it to be listed and then ordering it specially, which isn't feasible and wouldn't, wouldn't happen from a small producer that's not necessarily in Vermont. Um, so to summarize, um, I think that the, the, alcohol the alcohol definitions are not clear the way they are. Um, and I think that they need some changes. And I think that the change that uh, is proposed at the moment would in fact benefit not just me, but also all the other wine producers, the wine sellers and the bars and restaurants uh, throughout the state. So Kobe, one, um, a couple points. Um, I believe we allowed some wine stores to apply for a, uh, a fortified wine license. Is that right? So if these stores, if these wine stores do not carry fortified wines, um, they could if they chose to get a permit. Is that your understanding as well? And that's that's with the fortified yeah, my understanding wines. is that there's the special fortified wine license, um, but they still have to buy it through the state agency. So it allows them to carry it, but all the products still have to go through the, the state agency. Right. And then to your first point, you were talking about alcohol beverages, um, whether binus, the, the that, that you were saying that there are there are beverages that are um, fortified that are under 16% already that are considered vinous beverages. Did I hear you say that right? Or did I? Not did to my I knowledge. Say? No. Um, you you so were I saying said the opposite. Um, there are potentially, and I don't know if any of these are in the state, um, but you can make a wine that's not fortified that is above 16% alcohol. It's definitely on the top end of the alcohol range, um, but there are wines that are 16%. 16 or 16 and a half percent alcohol. And those in Vermont would be considered fortified wines, even though they're not fortified. Okay. Because the one of the um, one of the things that the commissioner brought up, and, and this comes up every time we do legislation, especially in the alcohol, um, is the unintended consequence. And that was made clear in the commissioner's uh, one of the commissioner's responses was you don't know, I mean, the, the, what's going to happen. And, and, and um, I, while you're focused on your product, do you, do you f foresee any kind of unintended consequence of, of allowing Ford of alcohol into what's considered vinous beverages now? I mean, I know it's, again, it's your product, but, but I mean, um, I'm trying to figure out like yeah. what you see, what you see in your world. And I, and I know you're going to argue for your, for your piece, but do you, what do you see? Oh, of course. 
um, as potential as potential um, unintended consequences of this. I'm just, you know, it's kind of a question to see how how your worldview is. Um, I mean, I think a, a clear definition of what things are included in the Venice beverage and and that there's an alcohol limit. There aren't, aren't that many bad consequences. So I if you just said anything under 16 as a Venice beverage, then you get into the question that you were considering at some point earlier about what other low alcohol spirits count as Venice beverage, um, how much of it needs to be a wine product, um, those sorts of questions. Um, but if we, if the wording is specifically to vermouths or towards other fortified wines, then there's a, at least a cut that they need to be mostly wine, um, that they are mostly a fermented fruit sugar um, that maybe has a small amount of uh, you know, spirits added or other flavorings added. Um, I would be all for more specific guidelines for that also. Um, currently with what we're considering now under vermouth, vermouth is a very, literally is a very specific definition. Um, and uh, that, in, you know, involves what alcohol levels and what the base product is and what other things are adding to it. Um, and so I know that the, that the federal definitions are not the same as the state definitions, but at least um, in order for me to make something I'm calling a vermouth, I have to go through the federal guidelines to do that anyway. Um, so uh, I guess that's a long way around saying, I don't know what other unintended consequences there are, um, yep. but I think as long as the guidelines around alcohol are, you're not gonna get that much, that many different changes besides allowing more people to buy and sell it. Okay, Matt Byrong has a question and Matt, you're off. You're unmuted. You're unmuted on my end, Matt. Uh, I am not hearing him. Try it, Matt. Do you want to send a text and I'll read it? Okay. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, share with us a little bit, if you can, um, the, you, you said you got licensed to do this, to build your business in a certain way. And then the department came and told you differently once you had made your investments and went, once you had made your product. Can you just share with us a little bit of that history while I'm waiting for Matt to send me a note? Sure. Um, so uh, when I started exploring the possibility of, of making my business, um, obviously one of the important things to do is to figure out what the alcohol laws were around what I was doing. And so one of the first things I did, this was in uh, August of 2018. Um, I contacted the Department of Liquor and they directed me uh, uh, to Mr. Prevo, the director of licensing. Um, and I had several conversations with him about what I was thinking about doing and what I was planning to do. And my understanding from those conversations um, was that if I made my products under 16%, they would count as Venice beverage. Um, so I took that and made my business plan around that, especially around the ability. Um, so in Vermont, um, you're allowed to get a license to sell directly to retail stores um, as a Venice beverage manufacturer. Um, you can't do that for spirits or for beer or anything else that you, it's specifically for Venice beverage. Um, and so I had planned to do that. And I talked with Mr. Prevo about getting that. And, um, and so that had been my plan was that I wouldn't need to go through a middleman. I'd be able to have larger profit, uh, get into the, the right stores and bars that I wanted to be in, um, by, you know, my selling them myself. Um, I went through, you know, all the licensing process. I got the licenses that I expected, um, from those conversations, um, and then went on to start making my product. Um, what happened then was uh, when I, I basically, in early February, I, my products were done, I started selling them. Um, and I, so I was contacting various uh, stores, various uh, wine stores around the state um, and asking if I could you know, come talk to them and show them my product and, and see if they were interested. Um, and one of them uh, questioned, they said, well, hey, this is vermouth. Vermouth should be a fortified wine, which means you should have to sell it through this. Um, and I said, well, you know, I'm pretty sure that I have this right from, cause I've been, it's not like I did this without talking to the department of liquor, I uh, talking with them. Um, but, you know, I, I halted everything and, and set up a, a meeting with uh, the enforcement agents just to make sure that everything was okay. So that I wasn't doing anything illegal. Um, and when they came down and talked with me, I told them the same things I told um, Mr. Prevo. Um, 
And they actually decided to classify my stuff as spirits, not even fortified wine. Um, they said, no, 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 you're not making wine, you're making spirits. And I said, well, that's weird because I was pretty sure I was making wine um, or something that counted as, as Venus beverage. Um, and so uh, that's when I, for the declaratory ruling from uh, the board of, of the de uh, Department of Liquor, um, just because I thought that was a weird answer. Like if they had come and said, no, you know, we think this falls more under the fortified wine definition. Um, I, I don't know, that would have seemed more reasonable to me. Um, but so that, that's when I went to the board and, and asked about it. Um, and so it's, it's not that I necessarily think that they were wrong um, about calling for it wines, it's that I was very confused by sort of the change of, of tack by them telling me one thing all through my development and, and talking with them and them coming down for the site visit to make sure that, you know, the place that where I was making alcohol actually existed. Um, and then all of a sudden the other, that was the licensing department, and all of a sudden the enforcement department came down and said something different. That's obviously from my point of view, the department says that I misinterpreted what they said on the licensing end and that it's all my fault for basically making something and, and calling it something else. I, I can see their point of view on that, but it was very confusing, especially I'm new to the business. Um, so I assumed that what you know the licensing department had told me was what I could go by. Okay, um, Representative Byrong's question was just, he was asking for a clarification. Um, he just wanted you to walk him through the infused vinous beverage regulations pertaining to products with herbs, maple, et cetera. Do these fall under the fortified definition? He just didn't hear it correctly because you were breaking up at some point. So um, if you. Sure. Uh, so it, the fortified definition is only thing spirits added to them. Um, now, one of the ways that you can add flavor, and one of the ways that I do in my products, is that I steep herbs in spirits to make a tincture, basically, um, a concentrated flavor, and then add that to the wine. Um, if someone were to make just a wine that had herbs steeped in it, which I also do to get different flavors out of the herbs, um, that wouldn't necessarily be a fortified wine. So it is possible to make something that is like a vermouth, but not fortified, um, that if it's under 16%, would I think be considered um, a, a Venice beverage, but it's not exactly sure because if if the, if you were to do that and then the department were to say that's a ver would suddenly get pumped up in the fortified wine category, even though it wasn't fortified, just because the current wording is all vermouths under 23% count as fortified wines. So it would depend on whether the department would determine that what you made counted as a vermouth or not, regardless of whether it had spirits in it. Okay. Okay, Matt. All right, um, I've got John, Representative Kalaki. Thank you. So, Kobe, the commissioner said that he thought this had been resolved with you, with his board, and then we got an email saying, no, they haven't met yet. But is it your understanding that the board is going to un understand your dilemma and that there will be a favorable ruling from the board, or you don't know where that's going yet? I don't know where that's going yet. Um, as far as I know at the moment, my products are still classified as spirits because that was the last ruling given by the enforcement department. Um, at our meeting, um, we were talking about what defines the difference between a fortified wine and a spirit. Um, I'm pretty sure they won't rule that it's Venice beverage. Um, I hope that they'll at least rule that it's, it's fortified wine, but I, I don't know where they're falling. Um, from what the commissioner said, I, I guess I think that they're leaning towards fortified wine and that's what I asked them to. Uh, of that vision, but. So if they go towards uh, fortified wine, will that solve your dilemma about your distribution mechanism in the state or or, or not? No, um, no, because fortified wines are basically handled as if they were spirits. The only difference is that, uh, as uh, we mentioned before, that wine stores like to sell them. Okay. Um, your, your, your connection stops almost every sentence. So there's a little stuttering that's going okay. on. I'm sorry if I hadn't heard it correctly. That's why I was asking you, but thank you. No. I it. Good. No problem. <laughs> so essentially if every wine store had a, had the fortified wine license, that would be better off, but not every, not everyone does. Not everyone wants to have that, that license, but that's, that's pretty much the differential right now is, is the avail. I mean, if you, if this were classified as a vinous beverage, it would be distributed by distributors who, um, who go statewide into the 14 or 1500 stores. 
that there are and as opposed to the 80 stores or 78 stores that exist for um for alcohol is that right i mean that's kind of the way and, and, and no matter how you distribute on your own okay um yes if if it's if it's venice beverage i can distribute on my own or it can go through distributors to anyone who has a first or second class license if it is fortified wine or venice or sorry if it's fortified wine or spirits, then it has to be sold through the state agency. Okay. Um, and where they're doing, um, but yeah, only only through the state stores. Okay. Um, all right. And let me see if there's any. I've got a question possibly coming in here. Hold on a second. Um, Representative Byrong, I think the question, Representative Byrong's question was, what does a fortified wine license cost? And I think that's, Kobe, I'd be surprised if you knew um, what that was for a second class. Uh, um, second. I, I think it's not much, um, but I don't think, well, that's not true. Um, at least the, the local wine stores to Brattleboro, none of them have it because um, we were talking about what would happen. Um, I don't remember the exact amount. I, I don't think it's that much either, but it's still, again, it's a choice. I mean, I, I, I know that we allowed this to happen several years ago. Um, there was a wine store in the Mad River Valley who wanted to serve, uh, sell fortified wines. And so this was, this was kind of a, um, I perceived at the time as a big change for the department to, to allow that to happen. But, um, <laughs> but it is, uh, I think you, I think you're right. It still has to be invoiced through the state, um, in order to get to the store, in order to get yeah. the second class, as opposed to allowing it to be a vinous beverage in your case, a vinous beverage and, and have it just the ability to distribute it statewide, um, into 15, 14, 1500 stores. So, um, all right. Any further questions for Kobe? Kobe, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, to testify on this and and fill us in on some of the gaps that we had. We will, um, because this is a non-COVID related bill. I mean, we're going to continue working on it. And we'll have a further, we'll have a deeper conversation about about this issue um, when we get back to it next time. So thank you so much um, for taking the time. Do you have okay. any? Thank you very last, much. Yeah, no. Um, and good. I mean, regardless of how this happens, good luck um, with your business. Um, it's it's the craft the craft distilleries that we've seen, or the craft. Um, I don't know. Are you a brewer? Are you a vintner? Are you a distillery? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's really exciting to see this industry grow, and we and, and a vermouthery. <laughs> a vermouthery. Yeah, there you go. Um, it's always our it's always our goal to see um, businesses like yours to be able to grow and find the right place in our statute. So I'm hoping we can find um, find a place for you that that works. So good luck. And you're free Great, to hang out. You. You're free to hang out if you like. If not, um, um, enjoy the day. Hey, right, thank you. All right. Um, so committee, we are heading into our second hour, four minutes early. Um, I see that, uh, the representatives from the delegation have arrived and, um, I'm going to take, I'm going to take us all off mute for a second, just so that I can ask whether or not, um, they have a preferred order. So I'm going to unmute everybody just so that's um, Erica. Hello. Um, Chris, Chris Saunders, are you here? I am. Yep. And Megan, you're here. I'm here. Megan Foster. Um, did you guys draw straws about um, who would like to talk first to us? Um, I think I think you're all going to need um, have information for us. Um, Yep. Uh, typically, we go uh, by seniority. So I think uh, I'll go for Senator Leahy's office, then Erica will go uh, for Senator Sanders' office, and then Megan will represent the Congressman. All right. So I'm going to just give me a half a second here to mute everybody back up. And, and um, Chris, I'll unmute you starting. Where'd you go? Here you go. 
Okay, you are free to go. Thank you so much, all of you for, um, for, for joining us today. Obviously, we are the uh, Housing and Military General, Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Uh, we do, uh, we've been focusing on rental evictions uh, in our work since about March 12th in response to the COVID crisis. Obviously, we're interested in what, we, what you can tell us about um, housing issues, money that might be available for alleviating homelessness, uh, rental assistance, rental arrearages, uh, protections for people who are, who are um, in, in tough places, which I think a lot of the CARES Act handled. Um, and then um, certainly there's, we have some questions about paid leave, mm -hmm. but um, uh, the, the microphone is yours, Chris, start yeah. us off. Okay, um, so uh, Chris Saunders, I'm a field representative for Center Leahy here in Vermont. I primarily work on uh, business and economic development issues, transportation and telecom. Um, and just not having spoken to the committee about the various recovery bills, uh, one thing that we are stressing uh, that is, I think, needed to be mentioned is that you know the package that has recently passed, or the three packages that moved through Congress, you know, they're really focused on stabilizing where we are at the moment. You know, we feel like you know individuals need support, systems are are at risk, and this package was really designed to get resources out the door, hopefully quickly, uh, to help uh, states, hospitals. Uh, transit systems, uh, housing providers, colleges, schools, you know, make it through the next couple weeks and next couple months. And so there's going to be a time to talk about stimulus and recovery, and, and there will need to be more initiatives coming out of Washington. But uh, this has been the focus uh, right now. Um, as for uh, what is coming down the pipe, uh, I will admit I'm not our housing staffer when we um, got the topics you were interested in. Um, I'm not sure we saw that. So let me go off the cuff a little bit and say, um, you know, there are resources that are coming uh, via formula to the state, uh, specifically through the Community Development Block Grant and the Emergency uh, Solutions Grant Program, um, both of which uh, the state can utilize uh, for uh, assisting folks with housing needs. Uh, so, you know, emergency solutions grants, uh, rapid rehousing and, and uh, helping folks find shelter uh, are some of the things that that program can be used for. Um, and then the state has, has pretty broad authority to be able to use the CDBG funds um, in a number of ways. I, I was planning on with uh, the delegation, we, we kind of split up topics that we uh, were under the impression you were interested in. So I was going to run through some of the supports for employers, if that's okay. Um, does that make sense, Tom? Okay. Uh, so there are uh, three primary things out there to help uh, business owners, nonprofits, uh, sole proprietors, independent contractors uh, that were part of CARES and uh, the first one uh, is a program that the Agency of Commerce worked really hard to get stood up in conjunction with the Small Business Administration. It's called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. This is a program that would provide a loan up to $2 million to a business uh, with the ability to get an upfront $10,000 grant. Uh, at the time of application, within within a couple of days, SBA is is supposed to provide that uh, ten thousand dollar grant to a business. It is available to nonprofits, uh, sole proprietors, independent contractors. Uh, currently, we're having a little bit of a struggle uh, convincing them that uh, farmers and folks working in the agriculture industry should be able to participate in the program. Uh, but that's that's under um, under review. Uh, so. That's one program that's available. There's another program that I think a lot of businesses and nonprofits have been focusing on and anxious to hear all the details about. Uh, that's the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, this program would provide up to a $10 million loan uh, to a business with the ability to have the first eight weeks of the loan forgiven if they were using uh, the loan to pay salaries, to pay expenses they might have, such as uh, rent or a mortgage, utility costs, et cetera. Um, so uh, Treasury is working on finalizing those rules. Uh, 
it, organizations that would apply would go directly to a commercial lender uh, or VITA or um, other, other entities that are gonna be approved to participate in the program, such as uh, the Farm Credit uh, Service Agency. So that is gonna be a program that's coming online. They had hoped to be able to start taking uh, applications for that program starting tomorrow. Uh, that feels ambitious, uh, but that, that is what Treasury has been saying that they hope to be able to do. And uh, finally, uh, the, there was an additional infusion of funding for uh, the network of providers that provide free business consulting. So the Small Business Development Center, uh, the Women's Business Center, uh, there are resources that are going to come out to allow SBDC and uh, Gwen Pacalo's group uh, to get additional resources because we know a lot of businesses are having to work through what are some really complicated decisions about how, uh, how they participate in these programs, uh, which, uh, which one is a good fit for them and, and just how they get through this really challenging time. So uh, there are a whole bunch of details that we can go into on these programs, but at the risk of overwhelming folks with, with stuff that is or is not pertinent to them, maybe I'll pause there and uh, hand it over to Erica for for her to talk about uh, her portions. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think we'll, um, and we'll go through Erica and then and then Megan, and then we can open up for questions too. Um, Erica, you're on. Okay, thank you, Representative. Um, and uh, for the record, my name is Erica Campbell and I am an outreach representative and policy advisor for Senator Sanders. Um, and thanks to the committee commit to the entire committee today um, for inviting our office to testify. Um, I just wanted to say before I start, I am going through um, my computer and if anybody um, can't hear me well or I'm starting to break up, just unmute and holler and I can I can call back in on my phone. Um, so far so, so good, yep. Okay, great. Uh, the federal stimulus package uh, signed on March 27th, as Chris um, mentioned, uh, was it was far from perfect. But um, I do want you to know that Senator Sanders fought hard to ensure you know, relief is going to working families. Um, it is the largest emergency relief package in American history. Um, and a significant part of this law is the expansion of um, unemployment insurance. I did want to let you know that Senator Sanders Call, um, has called on the U.S. Department of Labor to do everything within its power to help states rapidly disperse these unemployment benefits. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of work that we all have to do to really effectively implement um, many of the programs um, that are in, are in the Act. So I'd just like to, I'd like to briefly go over um, unemployment insurance. Um, I can also talk a little bit about the, the paid leave. I think you may have already been briefed on that. I did check your agenda uh, that this week and it looked like you, you did uh, talk a little bit about that yesterday. Um, I don't, I am not the housing person for Senator Sanders, but I do, um, I did just find a tiny bit of information about that, but I think it may be best also if we, if, um, I'm not sure if Megan can speak about that a little bit more, but we could always send you some information. And then if you had more follow-up questions about the housing, we can get um, our, one of our housing experts on um, to, to speak with you more. So um, the act provided um, 260 billion for unemployment. The pandemic unemployment assistance is really, um, uh, it's a brand new program and it covers individuals who cannot qualify, do not normally qualify um, and are unable to work because of the COVID-19 um, public health emergency. So these are self-employed workers, um, gig workers, independent contractors, sole proprietors, and part-time workers and, and folks with limited work histories. Um, it will be state administered but fully fund federally funded and the Department of Labor is you know, working extremely hard on getting this program up and running. We did just hear um, on, uh, our, so on our, our office did hear there was at two o'clock today, there was a town hall, um, DO, Vermont DOL did a town hall and said it might be a while, maybe a couple of weeks for these folks to apply. So it's, you know, we're hoping it's was sooner than that. We understand the state DOL is just completely over, uh, it, it is just inundated. Um, so there's also the additional $600 um, compensation compensation to every weekly unemployment benefit. 
Um, that's effective up until July 31st. Um, and did just want to note that that is that is a taxable um, uh, benefit. Uh, I think I'll say that's all I'll say about that. Um, also, there um, are expanded uh, unemployment benefits are expanded. So um, it's in, you know to include part-time self-employed and gig economy. Um, there's an additional 13 weeks of federally funded unemployment benefits for individuals who like have already exhausted their their state benefits. Um, you know, I think throughout the last year. Um, but there will be that sort of expansion, um, and uh, it does provide federal funding to the states uh, that do not have a waiting week period, uh, a waiting week between applying and receiving the benefits um, through the 31st of, of December. Um, a few we've, you know, our our. Our, I'm sure you have gotten calls and our office has gotten many, many calls from um, all of our offices from Vermonters uh, with questions about this. And um, as we know them, we are uh, trying to get information out. A few questions that we have gotten pretty frequently um, is around this income piece. Um, and it is treated, these benefits like, like normal unemployment, they're treated as not, it's non-work income and it's taxable. Um, so it may affect the eligibility for most government programs like food stamps or three squares, Vermont, SNAP, um, supplemental security income, uh, SSI, low income, um, energy assistance, IHEAP, and um, subsidized housing. So that's kind of a big deal. And we want to certainly make sure that nobody ends up losing benefits or becomes worse off because of this. Um, the, the, the bill did, though, include, um, it did say that UI and pandemic unemployment assistance will not count towards income for Medicaid and SHIP eligibility. So it's something for us to consider for the next um, bill, if there is one, and just really thinking about how to make sure we mitigate the effects of any negative effects that that might cause. Um, and also just wanted to mention tipped workers um, who normally would qualify for unemployment can get that additional $600 per week. Um, if they are, they don't, if they don't have enough income to qualify for UI payments, they're, um, they may be eligible for a smaller payment under 600. So most people, most everybody is going to get this $600, but for tipped workers that don't quite qualify, they, they may have, they may have to work out like a smaller Payment. I'm not really quite sure what that looks like, but um, and then also the workers who receive the unemployment are not eligible for paid leave. So, Tom, did you want me to go over paid leave at all? I know that you had talked about this yesterday. Um, committee, if you want to nod your head, if you want to hear more about paid leave, or if it's um, if we want to hear from Megan first and then maybe come back to it. Um, Let's do that because of the paid leave program. I mean, it, it 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 is a spiral and it gets more complicated as you know, how does an employer balance paid leave versus the unemployment, um, et cetera, and so on. So plus the 50, the 50 employee piece of it really affects, I think Damien Leonard testified yesterday, our legislative council testified yesterday that by that definition alone, you know, it 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 doesn't affect, you know, 92 point something odd percentage of Vermont businesses. So that's um, right. Yeah. yeah. So let's pass that on right now, and and we'll go to Megan, and then we'll then we'll um, we got one question so far, but Megan, it's all you. Let me, you are unmuted. So. Great. Thank you, Chairman Stevens, members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Megan Foster. I serve as. Sorry. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> uh, I serve as. Congressman Welch's legislative director in his Washington DC office. Um, today I'll talk, I'll talk about the economic impact payments. Um, and please note that the information I'm providing is current as of the latest IRS guidance, which was published Monday the 30th. And we had a brief update last night um, that provided some good news for social security recipients. Um, as we know, People are expecting if you're single with the adjusted gross income of $75,000, you'll receive a $1,200 payment 
for, and that will be $2,400 for married couples under 150,000 and then $500 per dependent child. The definition, one of the most frequent questions that we're getting is what is a dependent child? The definition that was used in the bill is a more restrictive definition. So it's um, under the age of 17 for what you filed on your tax return. Um, if you filed in 2019 that you had a 17 year old and a 15 year old, you will only get the $500 for the 15 year old. Um, you will not be able to get it for the any college students, for example. Um, and if you have claimed a dependent on your tax return, you are not, they will not be able to get a separate check or separate benefit. Um, I think we, I know our office has gotten a lot of questions. I assume the Senator's office have gotten a lot of questions about this. Um, Congressman Welch has co-sponsored a bill led by a colleague to fix this problem for future packages if, if those come in, if those come into play. Um, but it's definitely something that uh, I think we're all very concerned about. Um, for so the other big question is um, for Social Security recipients. There had been guidance that if you receive Social Security and you don't normally file, that you would have to file a simple tax return. Luckily, the de Treasury Department and IRS reversed themselves and said, if you receive Social Security and you meet the income thresholds, you will not have to file a separate form. Um, this is very good news. We're very happy about that. There will still be some folks that will need to file a simple form that IRS will push out and then, but they have not finalized what that will look like for very low income people who don't normally file. Um, and what our, all, all of our offices will do, we will push out this information as soon as we have it and, you know, we'll definitely depend on um, your good committee and others to push it out to your constituents as well, because I think that's going to be a real challenge to reach those folks who don't normally file and who are very low income. The other in update that we received last night is we should expect the check or expect the direct deposit the week of April 13th. That's the goal that the Treasury Department has put out. Um, we're really hopeful that the direct deposits will hit then. And then for paper checks, those will probably be issued, start being issued about three weeks after that. Um, and the goal of the Treasury Department is to go from lowest income to higher income and in getting the paper checks out. So we're hopeful that that process will go smoothly. We will definitely be in contact with everybody um, to answer questions as those go forward, because I think that's going to be a big, um, important part of it. Um, but I think it's, you know, always important to recognize that this is a very small, this will meet a very small part of the need that's in our community right now. Um, so as we go forward with future packages, I think we're going to have to look at um, ways that we can continue to prop up um, folks who are getting left behind right now because it's definitely um, a scary time for everybody. Um, that's really what I was going to focus on. So I'm happy to take questions from um, the members and I appreciate your time and all the service you do for the state. Great. Thank you, Megan. I'm going to unmute Matt Byrong, Representative Byrong. Are you back on with us? Mm. Check your check your volume. No, do you want to just leave us uh, um, again on the chat screen? Do you want to leave a question on the chat screen? I can't, we can't hear you at all. All right, I'll move over to um, Representative Gonzalez. I know some folks are having, well, firstly, thank you so much for being here today, um, all, all three of you. Um, but uh, specifically around the, the um, check from the taxes and filing taxes that there's been some confusion on what taxes uh, or if people can file their taxes how do i phrase this um 
what, because it's based on your latest tax um, that you filed, that I know some folks are trying to get their taxes done now um, and the, um, the check timing seems very soon um, in a lot of ways, even though it'll, it'll be, feel very late for, for a lot of folks who are hurting right now. And so I'm wondering about that timing of if there's uh, folks can file up until X date and would um, have that most recent uh, tax return be counted or, or what that, if you, if you know. Yeah. Um, I just double checked uh, the IRS website because they are still advocating that people file their 2019 taxes to use that information to get the, the payments out, but there's no deadline corresponding. So we don't have a good answer. You know, given the timing, I would say if people should file within the next week, and that would probably be with in the IRS system in enough time for those payments, but I don't know that for sure. Thank you. We also just found out that um, if you have, so if you're on social security and you do not file, then you can, you are automatically going to be getting the payment. You do not have to, um, uh, you do not have to file. Is that, does that set, sound right, Megan, to you? That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. Okay, and Megan, I don't know if you can see in the chat box, but um, Representative Virong's question for the one-time money, are you using federal adjusted gross or federal taxable income and also taxable income from what year, 2018, question yeah. mark? Uh, great question. It's adjusted, adjusted gross income and it's for whatever, either the 2018, or the 2019, if you had filed your 2019 report, your taxes, it'll use that number. Otherwise, it'll just use your 2018 tax return. All right, and Representative Kalaki. Yes, uh, Chris, um, there's been a lot of, um, I think, hope in, in the business community that the small business loans could actually be also transferred over to a grant. And uh, for instance, one of our um, re restaurant folks from the farmhouse group, as you probably know, had to lay off 250 people. And so he said there's really, in his five restaurants, there's nothing to get a loan against. And so yeah. is there a possibility that some of this can be considered or transferred into a grant yep. for the business owners? Um, so the way that would work, uh, as a business applied to receive a loan, uh, they would be able to have eight weeks of the loan forgiven. And I think that is what Congress has and, and Treasury are seeing as a way to incentivize businesses to continue to pay or help them get through uh, the, the, current, the current crisis. Um, you know, I've talked with Jed and uh, a, a number of other restaurants that are concerned ab about this. You know, they, they, one of the things that has changed in the last couple of days. And so I think we're, we're, we're urging some of the same patients that the governor was urging yesterday because things are rapidly changing and there's a lot of information and there's a lot of interest. Um, one of the things that has changed in the most readings guidance from treasury was uh, that this was originally, as passed by Congress, a 10-year loan window that the, uh, the business would have 10 years to repay the loan. Congress has moved, or the Treasury Department has moved that up to two years. And so some restaurants are saying to us, you know, how am I supposed to pay back uh, a significant loan in two years when I'm not sure when I'm going to start to be able to open my doors? Uh, so that's a very valid question and one um, that a lot of us are scratching our heads at why Treasury took that step and are engaging with them today uh, to, to see what kind of uh, flexibility they'll put there uh, for, for a lender to make a loan of a different term. So uh, yes, for restaurants, uh, they're in a very challenging spot and, and there are a lot of folks working to try to see how we can make sure that the aid is as flexible and as you suggested, uh, becomes a grant. Um, and, and not just a, a pure loan. That, we heard that loud and clear as a concern. Okay, and the 
eight weeks of loan forgiveness is if it's paid for employee salaries. Is that correct? There, there are some criteria that uh, it, the what the loan would need to be used for for it to be forgiven. Um, and I have a uh, I can share in the chat a document uh, that is a small business owner's guide that that lays out some of the details. Um, one of the other key components is that the loan forgiveness is tied to a business um, maintaining some employment levels. So uh, if they would they would need to keep on staff or hire back uh, by by June, um, the a number of employees that would match what their employment level was around mid mid February. Uh, so that. The amount of forgiveness is intended to say we want you to get people back on payroll and be paying them their salaries. And so if you do that, then you will have the, the loan forgiven. Okay. And this, the, thank you. And this uh, first ten thousand dollar immediate. Yeah. Is that you did say the word grant, but I yes. is that grant? What, what, what is this first 10,000? Sure, so there are two programs. So the program we were just talking about is called the Paycheck Protection Program. There is a second program called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And that is the program where it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to apply for. Uh, you, upon submission, uh, there's a box at the end of the application says, you know, please send me in advance $10,000. That would be a grant. And businesses are, and nonprofits are supposed to receive that funding within three days, regardless of whether uh, they are approved for the loan or not. So uh, that for, for many businesses might be a very viable option and something that makes a lot of sense for them if they're a, a very small business or don't need a longer uh, uh, piece of operating capital. Um, there are a couple other quirks about that loan. Uh, one is you don't request an amount. SBA will tell you how much you are approved for, uh, which is, I know some people have been scratching their heads about. Um, and yeah, the, the desire is to get money out to people quickly. We, we do not know yet um, if it is a guaranteed $10,000. For example, if you were a very small business that maybe only had $20,000 of income a year, uh, we're not sure whether SBA is going to prorate that $10,000 based on your economic hardship. So uh, those grants, to my knowledge, have not yet gone out the door, but SBA is working to figure out how, how that mechanism is going to work. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Matt, are you on? Did you could? No. No, the sound didn't happen again. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Representative Triano. Yes. You are unmuted. Okay, so I have two questions. One is I haven't heard from anyone um, regarding the hold, hold harmless uh, on the experience rating for, um, for employers. And we had heard a fair amount about that prior to the release of this uh, package. Um, and I was wondering if anyone could comment on that. The other is that um, the $10,000 grant that you just spoke of, of um, are there earmarks for that money uh, once it's granted? <laughs> Chris, do you wanna talk about the hold? Are you, do you mean the hold harmless for um, an employer when they're, um, when their employees go on um, right. unemployment? Right. Or yeah. do you mean? Their experience, yes. yes. Their experience okay. rating uh, when they have all their employees go on unemployment. Um, I understood that to be a state issue, but I could be wrong. And I thought, I think may, maybe it's both, um, but I thought I did see that in the Vermont legislation around something around that. But I'm sorry. There, there, were, there were provisions in the federal law as well that, that uh, took care of that issue. Did. And I, we can work on getting you the, the specific section that, that clarifies the, the hold harmless about the experience rating. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the $10,000 grant question, you know, the, um, the purpose of uh, the loan is really to, 
you know, help uh, businesses with with their with their you know the economic hardship that they're they're experiencing. Um, I have not yet seen a piece of guidance though that specifies a business has to spend um, certain categories of uses for that ten thousand dollars. But you know that the goal is to cover expenses with a loan um, that they would have been able to meet had the disaster not incurred, such as payroll or other operating expenses. That That's the intention behind it, um, but it, it's a valid question. Um, okay. Thank you. Rep Representative Gonzalez. So Chris, I, I chatted this, but you mentioned the two-year payback instead of the 10-year payback. And so I'm mm -hmm. wondering if that's for both of the programs or um, if it's just for one of them and if so, which one? Uh, it is for uh, the two-year payback is for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, and I'm trying to look through my document right now to see if there um, is uh, whether it specifies the the terms of that loan. So let me find that for you, and I'll, I'll, I'll provide the answer as soon as I have it. Thank you. And and, and Chris, I'm not sure if you saw uh, Representative Byrong's chat for a request to connect after um clearly he's there's a there's a a muting issue happening here and so if you could reach out perhaps start with email and 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 then matt uh representative byron when you ask your complicated question here um if you could share the information with us on uh, with the committee on email that would be great um happy to do that uh representative hango you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, Matt's question just made me think of a constituent who has a business that wrote to us today that um, he has people not showing up to work because it's easier for them just to take the money and stay home. So is there anything being addressed? I mean, since the extra $600 came from the federal government, is there anything being addressed about that or talked about right now? So uh, this, this question has been coming a lot, up a lot, uh, particularly with folks that are essential workers right now. Um, and so just so I understand your question, is the, are there any, um, Got a, any tie to the six hundred dollar additional you on insurance uh, unemployment insurance benefit that is tied to um, trying to help that person stay in their job as opposed to take unemployment? Yeah, I think that would be a good way of phrasing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as I understand it, um, somebody who is leaving their position to claim unemployment voluntarily needs to be drawing a connection between COVID mm -hmm. and uh, why they are not working. So an at-risk person, for example, uh, would be allowed to stay home and, and file for unemployment, which is you know, a direct connection and a different situation than somebody saying, I'm just gonna make the choice on my own. Uh, so you know, the framing of it has been people are supposed to have, a, have you know, whether they are, uh, caring for somebody that's sick or you know, those, those kind of broad categories. And, and we can share those as, as well. Um, I will admit, I don't know how DOL is going to interpret those claims and, and uh, verify information from, from people. But that, that's been a concern. Uh, one piece, uh, some of the regional development corporations have suggested to us uh, and wanted to clarify that there would be nothing that would prevent a business um, from taking the Paycheck Protection Program loan and paying workers more during this time. You know, we've all seen a number of businesses uh, either negotiate with unions or, or find other ways to increase pay right now to, to keep people in their jobs. Uh, but one solution that's been suggested by the, the uh, regional development corporations is that a business may take the loan have the loan forgiven uh, because they're using eight weeks of um, uh, the eight week forgiveness period and could be paying people uh, a higher wage to, to keep them on the job. But we realize that's not gonna work for everyone. And that's kind of a cumbersome uh, balance to a problem that the business did not create, so. 
So the the business, the business operator just really needs to make sure why his employees are not coming to work. If they have a valid reason, then it's a valid reason. Um, and if not, then they have to address that with the employee who's not coming to work. That That's my understanding. And, and I know um, uh, there are, I think, some provisions. And did you guys just pass Bill 781? Is that the number of what was just cleared? There are some provisions that call out uh, specifically why why an individual can leave. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Thank you. I'd like I to just add really quickly that um, Congress is considering uh, hazard pay right now and talking about that and for essential workers. And I know it's not completely related, but I think that having um, having a bump in pay for the folks on the front line would also potentially also help retain some of those workers. Um, obviously, if they have to leave, they, they have to leave and we need to have that, that um, protection as well. Thank you. Hey, Chris, you, you mentioned earlier um, in your opening comments and, and, and about where farmers have not been included in, in this yet. And I'm just curious to know um, what what steps we're taking to, I mean, and if they do become, I mean, I don't recall anything except through um, their own farmer's insurance or what have you, where they might be available for the same kind of, um, same kind of income replacement that we're talking about for, for other um, independent contractors. Yeah, uh, so uh, the farmers are eligible to participate in the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, it's the Economic Income Injury Disaster Loan Program that they're currently, um, we're trying to work on uh, to make sure that they can participate. Uh, I guess we gave the Treasury and SBA a little bit too much leeway in uh, writing the rules on this. And so uh, the delegation, I think, is sending a letter today, Erica, correct me if I'm wrong, to, to the yeah, Treasury today. Uh, saying, you know, you need to fix this. Um, and Erica's an ag specialist where I'm not, but uh, additionally in this package, uh, the Senator included $9.5 billion uh, to assist uh, agricultural businesses. Uh, so there are other forms of assistance. Uh, dairy was specifically called out in that package and uh, we're working with USDA on how they are gonna implement those payments uh, to help folks that we know are, are really hurting, uh, particularly given the, the price of milk right now. But Erica, if you do want to speak to, to the ag component. No, that was well said. I don't think I need to add much. I, we really just need to ensure that that additional money for agriculture um, comes to our producers. Uh, it's really unclear what USDA has, in, is, has uh, is intending with this money. And, um, and then the other piece is pushing uh, for farmers, small farmers to be able to apply for the IDA loan. So yes, we will be. Hopefully that letter will be going out uh, by all three of our offices um, by later this afternoon. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Byrong had a question on the chat. What about bringing the employees back off unemployment for regular wages under the PPP? This can be less than that max UI plus 600. Um, and then he throws in $15 by 40 is $600 by itself. I mean, you could do that. You can't have, they can't be obviously on both unemployment and um, PPP, but you could have them go on unemployment. If they're on unemployment now, or if they're about to go on, uh, you just, I, I think that you just have to rehire those workers back by, um, by June. It's slightly unclear by the legislation, but the employees will see that as a bad financial decision. That's right, right, absolutely. It's like if you could, if it depends. If you, sorry, I think I muted myself. You're good now. You're good now. Okay, um, but it's a it's a huge thing that a lot of the businesses are asking. Like, well, am I going to be able to get my workers back if because by you know through June thirty first they are going to have this extra $600. So for some lower wage workers, I mean, that, that's a pretty significant amount of money on top of what they would be getting for unemployment benefits. So that's why some of these creative conversations around um, can, can the PPP, can we pay more 
um, can employers claim more additional extra bump in pay hazard, you know, or not necessarily hazard pay, but extra pay to make sure that, that they're well compensated? Um, or maybe there's other ideas on the table. Um, I'm not sure. And Matt's kind of type in. Um, but the employees will see that you saw that. Yep. Um, if they refuse to come back, is that a voluntary separation by the employee? And that would make them ineligible for UI. I mean, I, that's a, I don't know that question. That is a good question. I mean, they technically are able to receive it up until July 31st. Um, the six hundred dollars. This is with the, the UI with the six hundred dollars. Right, with the six hundred. Right, but then again, that's that's given the conditions that they would be allowed to get it in the first place. Given meaning, various impacts from COVID. So if somebody starts back up, Chris, do you do you know or Megan, do you know that? And it, well, it's an interesting interplay too with the state. I mean, the state we made it lenient enough. So that if people felt that they were at risk at work, um, that they could that they could be self self they could be self unemployed, um, they can choose to go on unemployment if they felt like they were unsafe at work. So it, it's a it, it's it plays right into Matt's questions too. Mm -hmm. Chris, did you have any further um, on this? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but we'll we'll work on finding it out. Okay, and if we're paying them to stay home, then they, yeah, right. Yep, yeah. Matt, these are, what, what are you, a business person or something? You just have these questions that are just, um, I, I just like to take a, take a minute now and just thank the three of you for coming in. Um, given how busy you all must be in answering these kinds of questions, um, for all of your constituents um, in, in all the different many sectors, I'm kind of pleasantly surprised I didn't that you didn't pull in interns from 2017 to help you answer um, all of the screen time that you that you need in order to help us out to understand this. Um, and certainly, when the rules start being written, that's kind of the next chapter, and I think we're going to need you again. And I'm sure we will be um, in touch with you as a as a whole body to find out what the rules are as they're being imposed, because um, some of these programs sound great on paper right now, but our local experience after Irene with FEMA in particular and with private with the public private insurance plans is that it's never that simple um, when it's dealing with this federal money. So um, if there's no further questions from committee, I would just, um, I'll just thank the three of you for, for filling us in and um, get some rest um, and do good work. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, I've added a couple documents to the chat. Um, our housing team did uh, put together a housing summary. Uh, so rather than have us read it to you, I put it there for uh, your, your uh, perusal, uh, as well as a small business uh, owner's guide. So uh, we really appreciate the engagement and uh, you know, the work that you're doing. It's a, it's a good partnership uh, between the federal government and the state. And I, I know our office will be happy to come back anytime. Mm -hmm. Great. And just, you know, if you get a chance to download uh, Damian Leonard's, uh, the summary that he wrote that was yeah. that was published yesterday, yeah. it's a really good, um, it's a really good breakdown from the state's perspective about what he sees. And if there's if there's um, stuff that you can correct or make better, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so committee, we have a few minutes left here. Um, I wanted to get back to um our next steps with the language with respect to rental evictions we have a committee bill that has several elements to it that we've gone over um, we have the elements of the family leave program we have uh we have the whole rental eviction and then we have the section asking for funding um 
part of the uh, part of the documents that that Earhart Monka shared with us last week was a breakdown of what money was coming to the state. As uh, as Chris Saunders had mentioned, there's a formula for a lot of these things. There's small state, we get a small state uh, formula as well. Burlington area gets their own um, as the only urban area in, in Vermont, they get their own um, chunk of change on top of what the state gets. And so the, we still don't have any idea of, of how that money is gonna be disseminated, but a lot of the money that was, that was in Earhart's document is going to be used for programs like what we have put in the bill, whether it's rental assistance or arrearages, whether it's housing, um, whether it's through the emergency services uh, programming. Um, as we heard yesterday from the Vermont State Housing Authority, there are gonna be some protections for people who receive Section 8 vouchers or are in housing um, that have Section 8 vouchers attached to them. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on. But I would just sort of like to get, um, I'm going to unmute everybody and um, sort of get an idea of where we are with this um, and what we think we are comfortable passing along to the um, to the Senate as as language that they can then use. My understanding is that they are meeting um, as early as next week to try to determine, I mean, GovOps, their committee, as Tucker mentioned earlier today, their GovOps committee is going to be meeting and starting to talk about what the changes they need to do to their rules in order to have remote voting. But they are much closer to having remote voting on individual bills than we are in the House. And so in conversations with the chair of the Economic Development Committee uh, and General Committee over in the Senate, um, Senator Sorotkin and his vice chair, Senator Clarkson, um, they have they have heard our bill. Um, they will be hearing, regardless of what we do today, they will be hearing the the agreement that was made between the um, landlord association and the and legal aid tomorrow morning. And their request to us is to um, you know to be able to take the work that we've done and pass it to them and let them put it into a bill that would then come back to us. And so if they made any changes, we'd obviously have an opportunity to review it and then um, and make either further changes or concur on the work that they do it. But but basically what, what I would like to be able to do if we can before four o'clock is to um, have a straw poll and, and make a decision as to whether or not we'll, um, we can, we, can um, we feel comfortable passing on the work that we've been doing for the last, I don't know, almost two and a half weeks um, to get to this point. So um, with that, I'll just leave it open to um, conversation. Um, everybody, I, I've unmuted everybody. If you, if you choose to stay on mute, that's fine. But um, any thoughts, should we, so I guess what's in front of us is should we keep the, the family leave um, language in the bill as we see it um, or, or just take it out for now and return to it? At a, at a later time when we see how more of these uh, programs sugar off or um, there. And so mics are open. Uh, Lisa. So, yeah. um, I, um, I guess I'm still not certain how I feel about all of the language. I, I would like to see it, um, I think, John said the other day, let's take out the, the employment piece and make this about housing. And that would make it simpler, I think, um, because I feel like the Federal CARES Act is covering a lot of what we were gonna talk about. It seems like a number of things have been taken out of the employment part of ours. Um, the housing part, I'm still very, very unclear about the money coming from the feds that is going to go into very various programs that we support. And I just want to make sure that there's not a duplication of effort. I would really like to see where the federal money is going. Um, the part that we've worked on with the advocates 
that um, David Hall was with us for. I think all sounds good, especially given that both both sets of advocates on either side of the equation were in agreement. So that part, I would have no problem with going to the Senate. I'm just really, um, section eight, I just really don't know because I don't know where that federal money is gonna go. And the whole employment section, I'm not sure. I think that's section five and four. I'm not really sure if we still need it all. But I think we do need some of it because some of it addresses very, very small businesses. So I guess I'm, I'm too confused to take a vote. Sorry about the stuff. If you can see it on my screen, I got to figure out how to get rid of it. But I'm done talking. Thank you. Okay. We just see you. Oh, OK. John? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm Deanna, you did have your hand up. Deanna and then John. Um, so I um, I was just looking through the fact sheet that we just got um, to, and thinking about, Lisa, your question of, of the federal funds. And um, in the, the fact sheet about the CARES Act, it is coming to the state. Uh, and so then we can use those funds in the way that, that we are asking um, that this bill and this in front of us does. And so in terms of duplication of, of effort, it really um, from this fact sheet is not a duplication of efforts, but instead is getting an infusion of cash from the feds. And so what we have in front of us is, um, is a really great uh, structure to bring in that money from the feds and use it. So the fact sheet, I have a question on that. Was that just made available this morning? Like no, just it was just chatted with us right now. I'm sorry? It's in the chat. So you can oh, just I can't. I, for some reason, I can't read the chat. So that's so what you need a problem to, what, for me. So Lisa, what you need to do is you need to um, to click on chat. And your I do. And I have the chat up, but I can't scroll down, Deanna. So that's mm -hmm. been a problem all along for me on, on my laptop, which I'm not super familiar with how to use, but I can't scroll down any farther on the chat. So all I can see is um, like very small pieces, but it would be great if Ron could somehow put that on a committee page so that I can read it. So that's something that just came to us. He can easily do that. And so the my point, Lisa, is that the federal money and the way that that is written is uh, your, it, it solves your concern because the way that the federal money is coming to us, that we, if we have a scaffolding of a bill and we have plans of how we're going to support Vermonters, that we will then have federal money to do that. And so that, that's my point. Okay, I would have to read that for sure um, before I weigh in on that. And um, then my question is, why do we have a, a placeholder of $5 million um, for appropriations for our portion of the bill? And second part to that question, um, does DCF already do all of these things that we're stating in our bill that they should now do? So that's a two part question. Uh, I'll address the five million dollar placeholder. It's just been it's been there since we started working. Right. Um, it was done as an estimate, and it was done as um, taking into account what we know of how much it's been costing to provide, for instance, um, the emergency shelters that existed between November and April. Um, what it what the request was for the rental arrearages, I believe that we had a request to move it from the 800,000 that's in the hot program now, upwards to $2 million, if possible, that was prior to the COVID event um, happening. Um, the programs that are listed are programs that DCF and their partners as listed in the bill um, have direct access to. Um, you know, but the, the, the question ends up being, um, you know, that, that this is a placeholder. It is not usually our, our place is not to appropriate money. 
directly, um, but it is appropriate for us to make suggestions on um, that an appropriation should be made. And so this wouldn't get passed, uh, it wouldn't even get passed through the Senate unless their appropriations committee um, was going to okay that. And um, so that's that's the best explanation I can give right now. I think this is, you know, that back when we were still in the building and we, and we were compiling the list of services that we were putting together um, those were put together with the help of uh, administration officials and advocates as well um, to make sure that we were covering as much as we possibly could imagine. So now I'm still confused because we're going to get this money from the federal government. So why do we need to ask for money from the state? Um, and I know that DCF works with various agencies, but are we going to, second part of the question, are we going to be asking them to do something new and different that they don't currently do with all of this outreach and data collection, et cetera? Uh, I believe that DCF does all that already. Um, and again, in terms of the appropriation <laughs> itself, um, again, it would depend. I can't answer where this money is going to end up. I, you know, it may end up in the general fund, which would make the language here. But again, for today's conversation, um, and, and your points are well taken, but you know, the point for today's conversation is what, um, you know, obviously you're uncomfortable with that language uh, and, that, and, that, and that's, you know, I can appreciate that. Um, the question will be, how does that, that may, you, I guess a short way of saying is that that money may flow to these sources anyway, um, because they're that's what they are intended for. This is language that's a little bit more specific. Um, if you are more comfortable with taking the number out, I mean, I think it's important for us to say that we've identified these kinds of services that are going to be necessary for people who may be who may be experiencing the and the need for those programs um but i think the number itself is is something that will either change or can change um if you're uncomfortable with passing that number along then so be it you know we'll 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 consider that john uh, well, I, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, my, my first is that uh, I think for the time being, I would say let's take the paid family leave portion out of this bill until we really understand it and we can include that somewhere else. But to expedite this, I, I like leaving the appropriation in, but I think um, I like that it's um, to be used with the issues that we list on page eight of the bill, uh, 21 lines, uh, but that we don't create a new structure for it, that it is actually the Department of Children and Family Services is able to use as appropriation of up to $5 million to fill in emergency services that includes these kinds of things that we list. So that when we finally figure out the federal dollars coming in, that this, the agency can work with its partner and say, okay, what's falling between the cracks now? And so the, the only thing, so the thing I don't like about this is that there's like a new structure that has to be created. And I think in this emergency, we, we just have to trust the good work that's happening and not make this more complicated because it's not that much money. And, and so I, I think that would hinder responsiveness. Of, so, so keep 5 million in, keep it just to Department of Children and Family Services. And then the eviction stuff I think is, is great and we should absolutely send that to the Senate so that we can actually get consideration um, because, you know, the feds have done the thing with HUD, five of our counties have done one thing. We hear from the judiciary that it's essential that there's a guidance from the legislature on this. This is imperative right now to, to stop evictions uh, and keep people safe. So to, to me, that's almost the highest priority uh, in these components of the bill to get immediate action on. So those are my thoughts on those three sections. It, it seems to me that um, the HUD money is, would be coming to Vermont in the form of a block grant. And the notion that $5 million might get 
passed uh, appropriations uh, at this point in time um, certainly causes some doubt in my mind. Um, so that, um, th again, formating this, these monies into a block grant, it seems to me that the question would be, can we use the HUD money to, for this $5 million placeholder that we're looking at? Um, and I, I disagree with you, John. I think when we're talking about paying rental arrears and, and things that are absolutely pertinent to what uh, the rest of the bill states as far as evictions and, uh, and foreclosures, um, you know, I really do think they belong together. And um, I would be in favor of keeping all the pieces of this bill together. All three pieces? Yes. Including, including the family leave portion. Well, and, now that you mentioned it. <laughs> well, I think the fam, I think we discussed this yesterday where there yep. was, there was some discussion that the family leave portion can be dealt with um, if it needs to be soon after that the, that the eviction um, protection is, is the number one. Uh, yes. And Correct. that, and that the um, other services are, are definitely number two. Um, and 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 I just remind us that you know we will see whatever the Senate sends us back. You know this is this is the odd thing about this this crisis is that you know we're not finishing our work with a set solid vote that's going to send this bill to the floor or to the next that's committee. Right. We're we're sending this to the Senate, who's then going to send it back to us, and that is admittedly not the way that we usually um, we are usually doing this. But we are both in a position of trying to get this expedite this as quickly as we can, and that might be through using this. So, so some of our concerns and some of our confusion may may be um, we have more time, we have more time to um, to contemplate this as as it moves back to us. Um, Mariana, did you have a did you have a hand half up? Were you were you looking to comment? Yeah, I was thinking probably leaving the family leave, uh, the um, family leave portion of this out at this juncture is probably a good thing. Um, and I I also have concerns about that that earmarking money at this point which will is, is supposed to come from state funds, at least that, because this is, I think, I also am not so comfortable with that because we are gonna be getting an influx, an infusion of funds. Um, so I don't know if we need to designate $5 million from state funds. So what if we add, what if we, what if we use language when we transmit this to the Senate of something along the lines to the extent that federal funding is available to cover the expenses incurred, comma, we think these are the things that we need to focus on, that the money should be spent on. Is that sufficient? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a classic line, <laughs> but it but it at least puts across the intent. Which I again the reason the reason I think having the money, even to this point to the to have it be part of this conversation is to really illustrate how deep this problem may be. Um, I mean, I'm still receiving I'm still receiving emails from our local uh, homeless shelter that the you know everybody is stretched thinly here and it is it is you know it's it is impossible to a degree to put a number on it but but you know i definitely hear that perhaps the best way to move forward is to say um rather than take it directly from our bank account which we right. may not have is to use is to use money to the extent because there is i mean i can look at the list of money that's available and figure out that there might be up to x number of dollars but i don't know you know, I haven't seen the spreadsheet deeply enough to know whether or not that money can be spent on rental assistance or rental arrears. So I think that's a more prudent way to go though, because you can always you can always put the money in. I mean, we can always go back and say, okay, we will 
um, earmark a certain amount of money. But the but, issues to be clear though, to, for today, to be clear, is the committee is the committee comfortable with the language if it didn't have the number attached to it? Well, I'm looking at the uh, the summary that we did receive from Leahy's office that I printed out, and um, 4.6 million dollars of housing assistance yeah. uh, scheduled for uh, for Vermont through uh, HUD. So you know that's pretty close. So I I do I think that. Um, attempting to earmark this money um, in these categories that we have listed here um, is, is an important piece of the bill. Okay, and so- Tom, I wanna to be clear. I, I, I love earmarking it. Um, I don't like setting up a different reporting structure though. So you're asking about the language in this bill. So I, I would- How do you, how, how are you talking about that the DCF will be working with those agencies and those groups that have already you know that are listed in there uh, like the yes, uh, on page eight line 20 department of children's family shall develop a process for outreach to community partners landlords and tenants develop an expedited application progress for emergency relief develop criteria for prioritizing emerging funding based on um and they it's like well they're already doing this and so why are we asking it's like added an added layer of structure uh, that was my in question. In emergency relief. So, so I, I would suggest we, we, I, I like what we've identified as a priority. I would strip that out. I would suggest stripping that out. Did not it's set up a, a separate process. As I understand it, it's that language isn't, um, isn't about uh, making them create a separate process, but about allowing them to keep control of the process. And so that it, uh, it's not saying, oh, you have a process, scrap it, do a new one. It's saying it is within your control to decide how you do it. And so that they, can, the, they maintain the authority to do what they've been doing right now is the way that I, that I understand it. And if people feel like that language isn't as clear as it needs to be, if that's also the intent of what folks have, then, um, then maybe there's a, a way to, to augment that, those lines in some way. Okay, Lisa? So the reason I thought that it was obligatory, and I think John's reading it the same way, is right in the beginning of section eight, which is on page eight, it says the Department of Children and Families in coordination with blah, 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 shall adopt policies and procedures to administer funding for housing related emergency relief that is necessitated by the spread of COVID-19. However, this is a new situation. And I'm saying this to clarify for myself as well as, well as for John, because Deanna just brought this up. This is a new emergency situation that nobody right now has jurisdiction over. So this is something DCF likely already does for other housing situations. But because this is a new emergency situation, I see Deanna nodding her head, they have to be directed to add this to their list of duties because of the emergency situation. Am I correct, Chair, in saying that? Because <laughs> I think that's what the intent of this is. Um, I think the, well, I th wow, I'm gonna have to like split some hairs here because um, the intent is, the intent, um, it, my memory of the intent is to, is, is along the lines of what Representative Gonzalez was saying, which was, which was to direct DCF in this particular case to use the tools in their toolbox and the people that they already work with in order to do this. Um, I don't think you're wrong in saying whenever the word shall is used um, and shall in, with respect to this particular crisis, I think that fit in with the immediate, um, as we discussed yesterday, that this is session law, right? This is applicable only to this particular crisis. Um, so, um, so there, you're both right. Um, so, um, well, I, I'd say I, I, I'm, I'm not wrong either if I could interrupt because eight follows seven and seven was 5 million to be appropriated from the general fund to DCF for housing related stuff as defined in section eight. If we take out the $5 million and we just are giving guidance that we want them to include the list 
of, of things here. You know, so so let me the just see is three weeks old. They're already doing this work. And well, let me let me let me just let me just throw out different again. I'm treating like I'm treating my next communication with the Senate as as a you know as an email or as a kind of like a memo of saying this is what we this is what this committee um, felt like, and I I don't have a problem saying that um, you know we're solid on the eviction stuff. We we don't need to we don't need to talk about family leave, and when it comes to this portion portion, then and what I'm hearing is um, if you're going to include this in your in your work to focus on, you know, to the extent possible, to the extent that these funds may be available, that, um, I mean, that, that, and then just say, we're, we want to make sure that there's not a, that there's not a new infrastructure being set up that, that, that um, works against what's already been in, that's already in place. And I will share that email with everybody when I do write it, if that's where we end up. And, and, and if I get and with, with the, with the, with the invitation at the end of that email saying, Hey, committee members, if I've misrepresented this, please feel free to, to chime in. Um, but how is that sufficient to say that we're on, we're not, we're not, we don't want to see a whole new structure being created, um, but that we want to make sure that the existing structure is addressing this particular crisis for these on, and, and with these particular spotlighted issues that we that we've um pinpointed is that I, I see heads nodding yes as long as this is what dcf typically does in any situation where emergency housing is needed then well, i think that's i think i think it is i think i mean in, okay. in all of their you know i mean this is when we talked to um sean brown this is when we've talked um last year to karen vestine and this year to jeffrey piffinger i mean people who are um, these, this is, yes, this is the category of, um, the, the people, this is directed towards individuals and families that have the least. And these are the folks that they work with. These are the partners that they work with all the time. Um, so, but I, but I think what's, what I'm hearing is that, is that it's, it's not about creating a special, um, emergency process. It's not, it's. I mean, they deal with general assistance. Everything is an emergency in general assistance. Yeah. Um, so, but it's not creating a cubicle that says COVID nineteen only, and um, that it's that it's operating within its within their um, existing structure. And we're not going to have the the appropriation in there because it does say they shall work to administer funding. That could be to, the ex funding. to the extent that funds are available from the federal government okay. um, is, is where we'll start with. How's that? That's fine. There was one other section in here and I'm just trying to find the line. Oh yeah. Um, page eight line 17 says they could use this funding for the purchase or lease of existing housing units for the purpose of isolation or quarantine. I don't know how likely that ever would be with the, um, with them taking over places like sports centers, auditoriums, National Guard armories, you know, places like that. Are they really going to need to spend money to buy or lease existing housing units just to isolate or quarantine people? Um, short answer, yes. Um, the And I believe the administration has, um, I want to say, I want to say almost two weeks ago now, um, has gave the approval to do that if necessary. So this okay. is this is um, you know, Champlain Housing Trust could identify based on their reading of of real estate listings five motels in the, in Chittenden County that oh, were for okay. sale. I wasn't thinking motels because Chris Donnelly came in and talked about that. Right. I wasn't even thinking motels. I was thinking more like houses. Yep. No, it's, it's, um, homes. no, this would, this is geared towards, this is geared that towards, is. um, the motels and, and, and I don't believe purchase, you know, purchase was something that came up in the first blush and it's more, probably more geared towards leasing right now. Okay. So right. See, it, 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 I believe that, um, all the Barry shelters, Tommy, you might know more about this, uh, were emptied and all their residents were placed at the O'Connell Lodge. Okay. 
And those vouchers draw down from DCF. So that's already happening um, in, in their scope of things. That's, that's correct, Chip. That has happened. Uh, now in the kind of large. Yeah. And, and that's what they're working on as well in Chittenden County, but they haven't been as, uh, <clears throat> as expeditious as they have been in Barry. That moved quite quickly, and I thought that was an outstanding piece of work, actually. And actually, and the Econo Lodge is actually slowly being um, emptied out as well. Um, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I don't know the reasons exactly why, but but they have been, um, they were they were available, and I, I just don't know exactly what happening. But again, this is going to be an issue with homeless population is, um, is finding places that are, uh, more permanent than what we're used to right but they also provide support services um in in, in that same uh, area actually as well those people that are placed um do receive support services which we know keep people uh, or more likely to keep homeless people in residence uh, where they're placed okay um and i see david hall has joined us um, David, are you there? Do you want to be there? Or do you want me to just contact you? I can't unmute him. He's got me on super legislative council mute. Oh, there we go. David, are you there? I'm here. Um, so I, I'm going to just verbalize what we were just talking about um, in terms of where we think uh, and I'm going to write a I'm going to write an email to Senator Sorokin and Clarkson, um, and CC the whole committee, and you. Um, but basically, what we just I think we're just about finished discussing was um, our recommendations to the Senate if they're going to use this language in their considerations tomorrow and on Monday. Um, basically, uh, we don't feel like the family medical leave language is necessary right now. Um, when it came to the uh, sections that were the direct that that had a direct appropriation, um, we were just going to suggest that we that that we support language along the lines of to the extent that funds are available rather than a specific number. And that rather than th there's a there was a conversation about whether or not we were saying that the DCF should create a whole different system of implementing their, these emergency procedures. And we just want to make clear that it's we want to make sure that they're using their existing emergency procedures uh, to address to then address the things that we listed. And then the eviction proceedings that we've been working on for the last two weeks um, are clearly the, the the highest priority, and the commit this committee seems to be comfortable with passing along that language to the Senate, as it's been negotiated through uh, up until this afternoon. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, um, Emily. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, do you think if, if we're gonna move forward with doing what you just outlined there, do you think it makes sense to um, have a couple of our committee members sit in on, um, listen in on some of the uh, work that's going on in the Senate related to this language and maybe sort of be a liaison? I, I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of trying to expedite a process to get to the end game as soon as we can as smoothly as we can. It's just a thought and I'm, I think it has been employed by other committees. Um, but it's just something I wanted to throw out there. Um, I think that that's a good idea. Um, if we want to, um, is there anyone who has time tomorrow? They meet at 930. Uh, is their first, I think they meet from 930 to 1145 tomorrow. Someone wants to sit in on that. Um, uh, if anybody besides me <laughs> wants to sit in. A question about that. I mean, I've listened to some of their calls back before we were doing Zoom and of course couldn't say anything. So now 
that everything is on Zoom, would you be suggesting Emily to actually speak? Because that just seems to me like it's going way outside of what we're typically allowed to do. No, that wasn't my suggestion. Okay, so no speaking, just listening. I, I, I said sitting in on committee to be aware of the process that they're entering and you know we can we can help advise offline if need be, um, but no, I wasn't, I, I'm just trying to sort of make a connection between our committee and the work we've done on this to the work that they are going to do so that there's no misunderstanding and just for, for clarity and expediting the process, that's all. And that, and, and, and you know, and we have always been called in as witnesses, yep. at least as introductory witnesses. And so that we would not be, I would not wanna be, you know, a junior member of a Senate committee um, yeah that, in this that, process i would rather be a um um matt i think the i think they're meeting at nine um tomorrow morning if if you're available um i could certainly be available as well but if there were um we can ask ron if if a couple people want to if, if a couple people want to uh be invited in i think we need to just work through ron to make sure we get that invitation um well, and, and the, the nice thing about this process is that is since we're sitting in, we don't need an invitation. We just need to uh, go to the YouTube, YouTube channel and watch what's happening. That and was my suggestion. So, yeah, so, um, yep. so it's, it, yeah. So um, what time is our training tomorrow though? 11. 11, okay, thank you. And that's expected to take up to upwards of an hour um is what i've heard from ron so um so so david i again i will send an email this afternoon or early this evening with a with again with a with a written explanation of what of what we've come down to and um it's just something if you're working with the committee tomorrow that you know that you'll know in advance but we're solid on the we're solid on the um because we spent so much time on the eviction thing, I hope we're solid on that. And um, and then again, this is this is uh, a different process than what we're used to, and we're not going to get used to it because eventually this crisis will be over, and we will be back to our old rules, and we will be back to um, being in the building. But in in response to what we're seeing that we need to get done. This is probably the quickest way to expedite it at this time. So um, thank you, Emily, for that for that suggestion. I think obviously YouTube meetings are available for everybody. Um, uh, John? Well, I think that this is a nice opportunity in this crisis that the House and the Senate can work more collaboratively like this. I think it's a really nice model for us to rather than all do our separate bills. So I, I, I hope we learn from this and see how this plays out for us. And if we come together with, you know, uh, language that we're both starting with the same ground, it's, it's kind of a great opportunity. So I hope this really works. I hope so too. Yeah. I mean, I, re I really do. Um, so uh, last thing I have on my, on my list is to just say that I'm not sure yet what our what our um, meeting schedule for next week is going to be. Um, we still have to work on. I, I don't want to have a conversation now. I'm tired. Um, but the we still need to work out what we heard about the Vermont Vermouth situation um, a little bit. Um, so just make sure your notes are fresh for when the next time we meet, and we'll talk about that. Um, but I expect to hear more. We, I think we're all going to receive an email from the speaker this evening, uh, perhaps this evening, hopefully this, as soon as this evening, perhaps tomorrow morning on um, an update on when we're going to be able to get together next. And also I think we're, she's got to check with IT to make sure we're, we're Zoom capable. Um, and then we can, uh, and then there's security issues that have to be developed as discussed in the beginning of the meeting so that we will um, probably not know tomorrow what our schedule for next week is going to be. But um, as soon as I know, you'll know. 
Can I ask a question about that just to know if we should be keeping Mondays free as well or not? Do you have any idea? Um, I think we're adhering to, I, I, I would only, I, I think we're adhering to a Tuesday through Friday schedule Okay. Uh, until I hear differently. Um, okay, I know that the Senate may meet on Monday, but they also do that on occasion as well. So um, I don't think I would ever call a meeting like on a Saturday or Sunday before a Monday meeting. Okay, um, great. So, Thank um, you. Well, we'll be getting an email from Ron regarding this training tomorrow. We did. We did? Yeah, it was uh, early afternoon maybe. Yeah. So, um, so uh, Ron, I think- didn't get it, let me know and I'll happily resend. Okay. Um, was it a Zoom? Uh, uh, Meeting, uh, yes, it was. It was a regular uh, Outlook invitation, Outlook calendar invitation. Okay. It came at noon, Chip, 12.03. On lead Gmail? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. You but remember, we also got the email to IT to make sure we signed in to this account ahead of time. So everybody has to do follow that email as well. And that didn't come from Ron. Uh, Great. That came I had a from... question about that because uh, the chief sent us an account to set up, which I've done. Yep. And I've also downloaded Everbridge as an app onto my phone. So now I'm assuming I'm ready for the training, but I'm not You're sure. Done. Yeah. And that's no. what everyone else has to make sure. And that's what I did this afternoon, right before this meeting. You're way ahead of me, Tommy. So, um, yeah. all right. Um, anything else, Ron, if you could just sign us off and.